Will, it is great to talk to you about your new novel, uh, Love is Blind. Thank you very much. We are here in the, the Steinway Workshop, which is, of course, a very the, exactly the right place to be for your book. Um, this is a book absolutely steeped in music, but in particular, um, your central character is a piano tuner. Can you tell me a bit about your choice to have him as your main character rather than a composer or a singer? What was it that sort of made you alight on the, the piano tuner? Well, I was thinking of having a, a musician, um, but actually it's very hard to write a novel about music. Um, and there are very few novels that have classical music as their central theme. And so I very quickly realized that I needed, I needed some way into that world. And I suddenly thought a piano tuner might be the perfect portal into the world of late 19th century classical music. And then I had to find a piano tuner who was prepared to spill the beans. And I did find an amazing piano tuner. He's a head piano technician at the Royal Academy of Music, Clive Aykroyd. And um, I think he was stunned that anybody wanted to write a novel about a piano tuner. So he, he allowed me to pick his brains mercilessly. So, I mean, you must have done, you can feel that you've done a lot of research because there's a huge amount of detail. And in fact, just looking around this workshop, you can see the huge detail that's contained within a piano. I found mm -hmm. myself fascinated by the workings of it. And you get a real sense of that. Did you spend a long time doing your research before writing this book? Yes, I did. And, um, and the Steinway is interesting. It's all coming back to me now um, because their sound is so big that they can break through an orchestra. That's why the Steinway is so revered. And the reason their sound is so big is something to do with the double thickness of the surrounds, et cetera, et cetera. So once you get into the, um, the machinery of the piano, and it is a machine, mm. uh, incredibly intricate, um, it's absolutely fascinating. It's like a, like a watch, you know, mm. or the internal combustion engine, you know, all moving parts to produce these beautiful sounds. Mm. Let's talk a bit about that main character, Brody Munker, because the success of the book for me is that you really care about him. He becomes somebody who you know an awful lot about. Um, so you feel great sympathy for him. How did you go about doing that? And why was it important, I suppose, for you to, for us to feel sympathy for him as, as readers? Well, I think he's, um, he's sort of an innocent in a way. And, um, you know, he's a young man and uh, he's, uh, he's a classic uh, hero in the mold of, I, I would say, the Robert Louis Stevenson hero um, of Kidnapped or The Master of Ballantrae and things like these Scottish novels of adventure in a way. And Brodie's life is a kind of adventure, he travels all over Europe and things happen to him. And so you're sort of with him on that journey, I think. And, you know, he behaves badly sometimes and he, uh, um, but he's also, you know, he's an open, uh, nice guy, but he's also got tuberculosis, mm -hmm. a fatal disease. And I think knowing that the ticking clock of his mortality is going faster than anybody else's gives you a little bit of extra sympathy for him. The, the novel has a subtitle, The Rapture of, of Brody Munker, and, and this is a love story. It's a story about obsession. Was that always the case before you sat down to write it? Did you know it was going to have that pitch or did you feel it sort of swelling up? Um, it's interesting because it's the, the most historical of the novels I've written. I mean, I started a novel at the beginning of the 20th century, but this one starts six, uh, six years before the end of the 19th century and goes back a bit in time. So it sort of is a 19th century novel. Um, but I, in a funny sort of way, I wasn't conscious of that. I was just writing my usual novel. But when I finished it and, and read it through again, it seemed to have a slightly different tone. And I wonder if it is that slightly 19th century aspect of it, a, you know, a 21st century sensibility in, in the writer. But um, it is about frock coats and handsome cabs and um, getting the night packets to Antwerp and things like that. So I think it brings in all the, the, the baggage and accoutrements of, of the classic 19th century novel. But of course it is, as you say, it's a, it's a novel of, of obsessive love and that doesn't have any kind of historical dimension to it at all. Right. You, you've mentioned Robert Louis Stevenson as, as one of those sort of influences on it. And another I couldn't help but spot is, is Anton Chekhov. Um, there, is, there is a gun, which you know is mm. going to become <laughs> important, as Chekhov always said. Well, I think I'm sort of obsessed with Chekhov. And Chekhov had tuberculosis and died at the age of 44. He was a doctor, so he knew he was going to die. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson, interestingly enough, also died at the age of 44. 
a chain smoker. He didn't die of uh, lung cancer. He had lung problems. He died of a stroke, in fact. Um, so these two men, who are very interesting men uh, in their own right, um, sort of the ghosts, the literary ghosts behind the the, the novel in that Stevenson, the Scot, the, the exiled Scot who travelled, ended up in Samoa, uh, living in the in the Southern Pacific, and Chekhov, the um, the consumptive doctor whose you know, vision of the world was so modern for the late 19th century. Mm. Um, I kind of used all sorts of elements from their lives randomly to, to give the story of Brodie Moncur a kind of extra depth. And one of the things, the themes I think that came strongly for me was this idea of escape. People are trying to escape something often in their lives. Brodie is obviously trying to escape his, his father and his family at home. Um, we know that Laika, the, the, the woman that he loves, is trying to escape something too. Even John Kilbaron, the, the pianist that he mm. meets, uh, is, is trying to escape almost time because he knows that his, his fingers are not working mm. as well as they used to. Um, why was that theme so important to you when you were writing this <coughs> Well, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's, one of, it's my most Scottish novel. And, I, and another thing I did was to bring in themes from Scottish literature and apply them to Brodie's life and of course the, the horrible family and the, the monster father you know, figures very strongly in Scottish literature as does ideas of demonic possession and demonic pursuit um, and um, so all these uh, tropes if you like were uh, were kind of filtered into Brodie's life and it, you know Dr Johnson said um, the high road to London is the sweetest sight any Scotsman will ever see, uh, I paraphrase, but the Scots are great travellers and are great, uh, there's a great Scottish diaspora and, and Stevenson being a classic example of that. So Brodie's idea of leaving home, mm -hmm. leaving his country, his family and his father is uh, entirely consistent with that uh, particular ambition. Mm -hmm. And so he goes off on his adventure to Paris and, and his life changes. And just to finish off, you mentioned that you wanted to write a novel about music. And again, that sort of the pitch of the emotion in the novel is very much like music, which has this power to, to make us feel emotion. Mm. And there's a very strong description in the book of, of a particular phrase in music that, that makes people cry. Are you a lover of music in that way? And, and I mean, do you find yourself surrounded by these pianos? Are you, do you play do you, or are you, are you just an appreciator? Uh, I, I'm a music lover. I mean, I learned to play the piano when I was a, a schoolboy, but I was hopeless at it and so packed it in. But uh, I think it, I developed a love of music. Mm. And so I listen to all sorts of music, you know, avidly. And um, I listen to masses of classical music. But actually the original idea for the novel was this phenomenon that I'd observed that certain passages of music which have nothing to do with your personal history because that's usually what makes you you know well up um, that's when I met her or that's, uh, that's when we broke up or whatever but it, these are passages of music that were just music I was listening to but from time to time I felt my tear ducts begin to you know twitch and so on I thought is there something in certain sequence of notes that has this effect mm. And I did some investigation. I spoke to a composer friend of mine, and he analyzed what was going on in these bits of music. And I, th I thought, well, what if you wrote a song that made people cry and somebody stole it? Uh, and that was the germ of the novel. And then I thought, well, what song, what music, and so on. And off I went. But it was really that phenomenon that certain passages of music seem to have this power and I play it again and again and again and, and I can recognize the same effect each mm. time it's quite amazing yeah I think one of the things about music that does that is that it's this a surprising note in a sequence that you're not expecting and I think similarly your your novel is filled with little surprises as we find out elements of the plot as we go along it's a fantastic read, Will. so thank you so much for thank you time. my pleasure